Welcome to Found in Conversation, the film and podcast series that pushes intellectual frontiers and promotes the values of independence, long-term thinking, entrepreneurship, and responsibility. I'm Edie Lash, your host. Today, I am joined by Saul Khan, an entrepreneur who's built a nonprofit that aims to provide a world-class education for anyone, anywhere. Khan Academy has recently introduced a personal AI tutor for its students, powered by GPT-4. My guest thinks that AI is going to transform education for the better. He's written a book about it, and he's here to tell us more. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Good. Thanks for coming. Let's start off with a big question. What do you think is the future of education? That is a big question. Uh, and, and the answer is an answer that I've been talking about well before AI and arguably is what people have always recognized as the gold standard of education for, for thousands of years. If you go back to Alexander the Great, he had Aristotle as his personal tutor. And for most of, of human history, not everyone got an education, especially an academic education, but the few people who did, if you were a future emperor, member of nobility, it tended to be quite good. It, it was a, a tutor or a series of tutors who would personalize to where you are. If you were ready to speed up, they would move with you. If you needed to fill in some gaps, they would fill in those gaps. If they w had to make it interesting for your interests, they would do that. You fast forward to about two, 300 years ago, we have a utopian idea as a civilization, mass public education. Great idea, but we didn't have the resources and, and we still don't have the resources to give everyone their own Aristotle. And so we made compromises and it was the industrial revolution. We bat students together in groups of 30, moved them together at a set pace, uh, Pretty much, if students have some gaps, too bad, you keep moving, and at some point you sort them. These kids are meant for what we, now we would call the knowledge economy, the top of that labor pyramid. These kids someplace in the middle, these other kids who have really struggled, well, maybe they could be semi-skilled labor, et cetera, et cetera. The world that we're going into, uh, one, we, I don't think we necessarily have to make that compromise as much anymore, and also, it's probably not acceptable. Uh, if we think about the industrial age labor pyramid, we know what's happening with artificial intelligence and probably robotics soon. It's going to collapse those bottom two layers. And so we're going to have a much more productive society, a wealthier society. But does all of that wealth just accrue to the few people who can participate at the top? Or do we try to get as many people as possible to participate at the top? I think the, the second scenario is a, is a better one. Let's go back to that idea of tutoring, because I'd love to talk a little bit about your story. Tell me a little bit about how you got into it in the first place with one of your younger cousins. I was originally a, a, in software engineering, and then my first job, I'm at Oracle, and I did a bunch of tech startups, then business school, then hedge fund. And I'm always, it wasn't something that I completely fell into. I've always been fascinated by, could you use technology in some ways to, to support students? Even in college, I'd written some applications to try to help people learn math. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I have a captive audience now in my cousins. I see a common pattern. The reason they're struggling isn't because they aren't bright. It isn't because they are not hardworking. It's not because they're not, they don't go to good schools. It's because they had gaps in their knowledge. They're sitting in an algebra class. The reason why they're struggling with algebra is that they're not fluent enough yet in some of their pre-algebra and negative numbers or even some of their arithmetic, dividing decimals. So I started writing software for them so they can get more practice. And so I, as their tutor or their teacher, could keep track of that. And then based on how they were doing, I was able to personalize their tutoring sessions even more. So that was the first Khan Academy. It had nothing to do with videos, but that's where I, when I got the domain name. And then in 2006, I was showing this off at a dinner party, and I'm an awesome guest. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and the host hey, of, look at this. Yeah, look at this. Hey, let me show you guys a little software project that I've been working on for my cousins, everyone. Um, uh, but the host of the party said, well, how are you scaling your lessons? And I was like, no, I'm not. And he said, why don't you record them as videos for your family and upload them onto YouTube? And I said, that's a horrible idea, YouTube. Yeah, and it was very, it felt very low tech in, in certain ways because I'd written the software that was generating problems, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, but I gave that a shot. And after a couple of months, I, I was just making many 10 minute videos. YouTube had a 10 minute limit at the time. Mm -hmm. I was making videos that I saw my cousins were asking questions a lot repeatedly. Or, you know, I explained it to one cousin and a week later I have to explain it to another cousin. Uh, and, or I had my cousins send me some, some problems they had that, and I would do worked examples yeah. in the videos. And after a month or two, they said they liked me better on YouTube than in person. And, and what they <laughs> Did were that saying, hurt a little bit? <laughs> I think what they were saying, I, I, I take positive feedback wherever I can get it. Uh, so tell me about when you decided to leave 
the hedge fund and start up on your own? Because I imagine reading a little bit about your background coming from Louisiana, <clears throat> you didn't grow up in fields of comfort, shall we say. So I imagine, well, tell me about your kind of your relationship with risk and your relationship with, this is a big, potentially something that I'm gonna have to put a ton of money, my own capital into. What was that like? Yeah, I, I it, it's a, um, it, it's funny, uh, uh, as, as you mentioned, you know, I, I did not grow up by any stretch of the imagination wealthy and, you know, a single mother household and, um, you know, I was a financial kid, a financial aid kid for sure in college, et cetera. And you know, one of the reasons I was going to stay an extra year to to finish up a master's when I was an undergrad, and uh, you know, when I saw in the late '90s that I could, as a starting engineer or as a starting product manager at Oracle, make essentially four or five times what my mother was making, and I always had that in the back of my mind that hey, I wanted to have financial security. I'd gotten married. We had, um, you know, fast forward to about. 2008 2009 our our first child our son had been born um and the hedge fund job was paying well and i liked it it wasn't some horrible job it, but by 2009 i frankly had trouble focusing on my day job we had saved up a little bit of money essentially to buy a, a house out in silicon valley which is not a small proposition right and um you know my, my wife was in a she was doing her fellowship and become a rheumatologist mm -hmm. so they pay you a little bit but not a lot we were digging into our savings we said let's give this a year and um it it was a hard year uh but i think anything entrepreneurial whether you start it's a non-profit or for-profit you almost need some of that delusional optimism right <laughs> to take the plunge uh and then you almost always i think realize that the world isn't quite as ready <laughs> for, for what you want to do as you think uh, so that first year was hard and, you know, uh, about nine, 10 months into it, I was really stressed and questioning what I had done and, um, whether I, you know, undermined my financial, my finance, my family's financial security. Mm. Uh, but it's sometimes darkest before the dawn. Why a nonprofit? Why did you start it as a nonprofit? What, what happened was uh, working at the, at the hedge fund, uh, for, you know, seven, eight years, um, I saw that in many cases, there's a lot of for-profits that start with a very strong mission uh, from a mission-focused founder. But especially as you grow and you succeed and your stake gets diluted, and especially if you could think, do things like go public or get acquired, all bets are off. Uh, and a lot of what I was feeling at Khan Academy was like, well, you know, this is already reaching hundreds of thousands. This could reach hundreds of millions. And a lot of ways, what we're covering is evergreen content. Why couldn't Khan Academy, and it was delusional at the time, why could it be like Oxford or Harvard or the Smithsonian? Why couldn't it last for hundreds of years? And just as we have physical stores, we now have e-commerce. Just as we have physical institutions like museums and great universities, why couldn't we do the same thing on the, on the internet? One of the most interesting things that I thought uh, when I read in the book was around how your AI, Conmigo, uses the Socratic method to get students to learn and to the right answer eventually, or to write something slightly different eventually. How did that develop? Is that from your own experience as a tutor? I started a school where my kids go called Con Lab School, and one of the principles is there should not be lecture, and it should be active learning, which it can be games, simulations, group problem solving, Socratic dialogue. A good tutor does not say, oh, this is how you do the problem. A good tutor says, well, wh what do you think this means? Well, how would you approach that? Tell me what you know. And so that's what we, you know, so, so Conmigo does not give you the answer. It will nudge you well with, with leading questions. It feels impossible to live our life without our devices. And you can say, yes, there's, there are a tool that's used for good or evil. It's just a tool. But the fact is that we are all addicted to them. How can we use Conmigo? How can we use devices not as a tool of alienation, but as a tool of, of doing something with other people? Yeah. And as I say in the book, and I say a lot, all technology is the amplification of human intent. And the reason why many of us are quasi addicted or addicted to our devices is because there's intent on the part of the people who make the devices and the applications on those devices to addict us. They don't say it in those terms. I don't think they're bad people, but they're trying to maximize their shareholder value. They're trying to get 
more revenue, primarily through ads. And so they, for 10, 15 years, they've had specialized AIs, uh, essentially trying to optimize what to show you next so that you just keep clicking, so that you keep watching. Unfortunately, that stuff that not only addicts us, um, isolates us from other people, but can polarize us, make us anxious, angry, et cetera, et cetera. You're definitely going to have people try to leverage the new generation of AI to do more of the same. Get you keep clicking, buying you, get you buying things, mm -hmm. giving your data to other people. But I think hopefully there will be good actors. I believe we are one of them, Khan Academy is one of them, where we could use AI to not only do more personalized learning, but also maybe facilitate human to human conversations um, or to help mentor or coach you to, to go out there in the world and to do things. I also hope I have a chapter in the book on AI as a guardian angel mm. that just as the, there's AIs amplifying those many companies intents to keep you clicking and looking at ads. What if we now have AI on our side too, that can see what we're doing and say, Hey, you know what? It's, you spent 10 minutes on TikTok. How do you feel? Terrible. Do, do, do terrible. Like, do, do you want to keep doing this or do you want me to restrict it a little bit? Or do you want to do a little meditation now? Or when was the last time you hung out with your friends? You, you want me to schedule some time? You want me to talk to their AIs and schedule some time for y'all? I think there's a world where we can amplify that intent. Interesting. Salcon, thank you so much for coming and being with us here on Found in Conversation. Thanks for having me.